This is a joint initiative by RLUK, Research Libraries UK, and VDB, Verein Deutscher Bibliothekarinnen und Bibliothekare, the Association of German Librarians. So, welcome also on behalf of VDB. I'm Ewald Brahms from Hildesheim University, and as a VDB board member, I take care of our international relations. We started our joint VDBR-UK events at the German Library Congress at Bremen in June this year. And then we had uh, two additional events this July on openness and the COVID experiences in library spaces. And you see the titles on the slide here. Then on openness and library systems. And today we will focus on building a research commons and touch on libraries as partners in the production of research. I am, we are delighted that we have such a broad audience again today with colleagues from the UK and Germany. Uh, and Matt just told us that we have 170 plus colleagues who register for this event. Wonderful. We are very happy about this. Um, let me say a few words in German and then I'll get back to English. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, es freut mich sehr, dass Sie sich heute Vormittag die Zeit genommen haben für unsere vierte gemeinsame Online-Veranstaltung und damit für den weiteren Austausch mit unseren britischen Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Einige von Ihnen waren vielleicht schon bei früheren Veranstaltungen dabei in Bremen oder bei den zwei anderen Online-Veranstaltungen und kennen dieses Format schon ein bisschen. Ähm, und Sie wissen, und die anderen sollten es äh, jetzt auch wissen und erfahren, äh, zögern Sie bitte nicht, Fragen zu stellen. Und Sie können das auch auf Deutsch tun. Ähm, Thorsten Reimer und ich werden dann übersetzen. Und Sie können natürlich auch äh, auf, auf Englisch fragen und sich im Chat melden. Dear colleagues, uh, Thorsten and I agreed that our introduction should be short. So, Thorsten, please continue. Yeah, thank you very much, Eva. My name is Torsten Reimer. I'm a head of content and research services at the British Library, and I chair the RUK Digital Shift uh, Working Group. I don't want to say too much about this initiative, but um, it's been running for a little while, and the aim is really to help research libraries in the UK and through information sharing, really research libraries everywhere, to be better prepared to really use the potential of what we call the digital shift. We don't see this as just a simple shift from analog to digital. We have, after all, been doing digital in libraries for a long time. So it's both about how digital is shifting and how digital and analog can come together in new ways to enable us to serve our users better, to enrich our spaces, our collections, our stakeholder relationships, and so on. Um, we've published a manifesto that's linked to a wider work program that we're taking forward and the digital shift forum is probably the most visible part coming out of this uh, with a fairly large range of events already and thousands of participants from all over the world and this here is a particular strand to uh, have a discussion between Germany and the UK which from a UK perspective I think for us post-Brexit is particularly important because we still really see ourselves as an international community and we want to work internationally. So um, that I think for mine is enough for a general introduction. I would like to say a few quick words about housekeeping and uh, how we um, how we're running this event. So for the moment, I would like everyone to be muted and that's um, the default. You can then unmute your microphone uh, when you want to ask a question. You're more than welcome to leave your cameras on so that we can all see you, but obviously there's no obligation. The chat itself will be open throughout the event. So you can comment or ask questions in the chat. We'll, uh, Eva and I, try and keep an eye on, on those and make sure that we can uh, share them. Just sort of be aware that you want to take uh, that your message goes to everyone so we can all see it. We also have a hashtag for today's event. It's hashtag RUKDSF. So feel free to use this if you are on Twitter or other social media. And um, in terms of the conversation, as Ivan said, you can ask your questions in German or in English in the chat. 
or you can just raise your hand if you want to ask the question in person. Uh, that would be great, but we can we can deal with this uh, whichever way. I would also like to say that we are uh, recording this session and it's going to be made available on the RLUK website uh, very shortly. So just keep this in mind, um, in particular if you're asking uh, questions. So for the event today, we are focusing on building research commons and the question of libraries, not just as sort of service and content provider, but really as partners in the production of research. Um, we have speakers today in the sequence that they'll be talking to you from our UK, um, then from the University and State Library of Saxony-Anhalt, and then uh, two speakers, in fact, from the National Library of um, Scotland. And that will all be for this theme. The way we are going to run this is the representation, a chance to ask sort of quick questions, maybe if you haven't sort of understood something, want to have a follow on or sort of some clarity, and then at the end, discussion. We might not necessarily use up the full two hours, but the last events had so many great discussions that I think there is a chance that um, that could happen, but either way, um, we have the time. And before we go into the first presentation, I just wanted to very quickly flag up the overall Digital Shift Forum, of which this is a part. Uh, the links are here. You also have seen them when you signed up. We do have an ongoing program um, running through this winter. So there's going to be a, a talk in about a week uh, that has a focus on the shift in digital curation. And then particularly, at least from my perspective, interesting talk is the next one in January um, that uh, poses the question why digital is not the most important aspect of your digital strategy. And there's more events, uh, and just feel free to register. It's been, I think, a really exciting program, I would like to say. Anyway, with that introduction now out of the way, um, again, just a quick reminder that we are recording the session and we make it available either today or very early next week. So you have the chance to also point other people to this if you want. And with that, I'm now going to hand over um, to Matt Greenhall who um, is going to introduce you and in some way sort of lay the groundwork uh, by reporting back on a really interesting report um, that uh, our UK has published recently. Uh, Matt, over to you. Thanks very much, Torsten, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Greenhall, and I'm the Deputy Director at ARA UK. And in the, the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk through a major piece of research that ARA UK undertook in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council here in the UK, and also a research consultancy called Evidence Base. And this project, which ran from January to June of this year, explored the role and the potential role of academic and research libraries as research partners and as research leaders. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'll talk through some of the aims of this project, uh, some of its key headline findings, and some of the work that we've been doing in the last few months to implement its recommendations. So just to begin with like, what this project was, what it hoped to achieve, and who our partners uh, were in, in, in this piece of work. So as you can see, and as I just outlined, what this project really wanted to do is understand what the role that research and academic libraries were playing in the production of research in their own right. So the role of academic and research libraries as research institutions, both in partnership with academics, but also as leading research in their own right across a wide variety of disciplines. It only seems um, right that a project about collaboration and partnership was itself the result of a collaboration between Research Libraries UK, um, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which is the principal funder of academic research in the UK around the arts and humanities, and a research consultancy called Evidence Base, who are a UK appointed to undertake the research itself. This was a, a really ambitious project. It only lasted from January to June um, and had an incredibly wide remit and, and posed some really quite fundamental questions in terms of the role of libraries as research institutions. And I'll talk about these questions in a moment. It had a very strong research base. People really engaged with this project and it received over 300 survey responses right across the library sector and beyond included over 70 hours of 
interviews with librarians and archivists, university leaders and academics. It included six focus groups to really get down in detail in terms of the experience of libraries as research partners and leaders, and also included 10 case studies. Now, the final report from this research and its case studies and its findings are all available on the ROA UK website, and you can see these by following the link at the bottom of the screen. Just before we begin, I should just offer thanks to our partners at the AHRC and Evidence Base, and particularly the AHRC, who not only generously funded this project, but were also an integral partner throughout. They created the brief with us, they sat on the advisory boards, supported its events, which were um, incredibly uh, popular and, and fruitful. So a huge thank you to our two partners and the AHRC in particular. So this um, research project really sought to address four key questions, and you can see these on screen now. Firstly, the research wanted to establish the baseline of what position do academic and research libraries currently occupy as partners and leaders of research? What is the current landscape? What roles and functions do libraries play? Then, and probably most significantly, this research posed the question of what role could they play? How can we build on this foundation that's in place um, to enhance and increase and diversify the role of academic and research libraries as research partners and leaders? And are there any barriers that are preventing this? Is there anything that's holding libraries back, whether it's in terms of skills or institutional structures or perceptions? And then finally, if there are barriers, how can they be overcome? Now, a really significant thing about the project is that it used a very broad definition of what we meant by libraries. And this could include archives, special collections, museums, and galleries. So we use a very broad definition. We also uh, ensured that this project was cross-sector. We didn't just want this to be talking to libraries about the work of libraries, but we also wanted to involve other groups. So this project engaged very closely with the academic community, with university leaders such as vice chancellors and deans, uh, with funders and also with research managers. And as I've, I've just cited, there was an incredibly high volume of engagement um, from colleagues. Um, many people were interviewed, huge numbers uh, contributed and many thanks to any of you who did so on the call today. Finally, in terms of geography, it was UK focused, but placed within an international context. So this wasn't just restricted to the UK, but also drew on the experiences of colleagues working elsewhere. And some of the case studies published on the RUK website are international. So in terms of some of the headline findings and what this research revealed, and once again, these are, th th this is available in much greater detail in the report itself available on the RUK website. Firstly, the research revealed the incredible wealth of experience and knowledge and skills held amongst research and academic libraries across an incredibly broad array of subjects and specialisms. Not only did it recognize these from comments within the library sector, but also that the wealth of skills and experience is well recognized within some quarters of the academic community. Academics value working with libraries. They recognize that they have a great deal of specialisms and expertise. They bring a valuable contribution to the research process. But what the research also revealed was that there was a very wide spectrum of engagement. That there was a great deal of variation in terms of libraries' experience of conducting research, not only between one another, but also within the library. Some areas of the library are quite experienced of working in partnership with academics and leading research, and others less so. What the research highlighted that within the spectrum of engagement, there's a variety of ways in which research and academic libraries engage in the research process as partners and leaders. Around a quarter of the respondents who responded to the survey associated with this um, research from a library perspective cited that they had, their library had formally been involved in a research project. This meant that they were cited, they were named and they were costed as a partner, whether as a co-investigator or a research partner, 
uh, in terms of 85% of these um, respondents, or as a principal investigator or a research leader within 38%. So around a quarter of library respondents had been formally involved in a research project. Far more significant numbers of libraries though had been involved in research uh, projects as informal partners, offering support in kind. They may not have been cited in a research application. They may not have received funds or been allocated costs within research grants, but they were still informally supporting research projects, whether through advice, whether through support, their skills and expertise. So as you can see in formal routes, this informal in-kind support represented the majority of ways in which academic and research libraries were supporting research as partners um, um, uh, revealed by this, by this research. The reports also revealed that, as one might imagine, there was a disciplinary concentration around the arts and humanities, um, although there were some examples of libraries supporting STEM uh, research projects or, or, and, and leading these, and that the focus of many of these research projects in which libraries were involved were based around the collection, its origins, its historical context, its use or its preservation. What the research also revealed though that there was a diversification or the beginnings of a diversification in terms of the research projects in which libraries were involved that these were not just concentrated around the collection and its provenance and its contents, but also increasingly around digital scholarship, for example, digital scholarship processes and initiatives, things like text and data mining, uh, and the application of digital technologies and techniques to uh, materials and the interrogation and interpretation of the collection. So that there's a collection strength and arts and humanities focus, but that these are diversifying. And then what was also really heartening was that collaboration between academics and libraries was seen as mutually beneficial, with library staff and academics believing that collaborative research was beneficial to the wider higher education sector between libraries and academia. The report really highlights that the library can act as not only a conduit and catalyst of collaboration, but is also a place both virtually and physically for experimentation. The library is uniquely placed within universities to cut across disciplinary and also institutional boundaries. And in part to reflect this, there are rising expectations of the increasing role of libraries in um, research partnership and leadership. So 20% of library respondents expected their library to act as a lead organisation within the research project in the ne next 18 months. This is up 11% on those which had previously acted as a research lead. So there's a sense that 20% or an increased sense that libraries will take positions of leadership around research. That 33% of library respondents expected their library to act as a partner. And once again, this was an increase on those who had done so previously. 41% expected to um, be involved in research via another or possibly informal route. And interestingly, almost 60% of academics expected to collaborate with libraries around a research project in the next 18 months. And once again, this is up on those who had done so previously. So there are rising expectations and there is optimism. But what the report also highlighted that there are a number of barriers that sometimes can prevent libraries from fully realizing their research ambitions. These are not only at the level of individual staff and some of the challenges uh, that they might face, but also within institutions and collectively across the sector. There is a misperception by some academics and particularly some, and I emphasize the some, university research offices that libraries are not eligible for academic research funding. There's a misperception that um, you need a PhD or an academic contract in order to apply for academic funding. This is simply not the case and the AHRC has been unequivocal that you do not require a PhD or an academic contract in order to apply for funding, um, but need to show equivalent professional practice or experience. So there is a misperception in terms of eligibility for libraries in terms of uh, research funding. There is also sometimes a great deal of variation in terms of the recognition of the library as a research partner. 
that library staff are not always cited on publications um, or on research outputs, particularly if they've offered support informally. There is sometimes an absence of a shared understanding of research. Libraries don't always see what they do as qualifying as research, even though it might do. And that the reward and recognition structures, particularly associated with the UK's research excellence framework, are not always well suited to recognising the contribution of libraries. Finally, there is a recognition that there are capacity and confidence issues among some library staff who may wish to pursue uh, their uh, wish to pursue research projects or, or lead research initiatives, but that these have to come on top of their day to day role that they don't have capacity and also may lack confidence. So there is a, a, an important question in terms of the relation of research to the work of uh, libraries uh, themselves. Now, the report contains 13 far reaching uh, recommendations, and these are centered around the four areas you see on screen. Recommendations in terms of how not only libraries, but also consortia like RA UK and funders like the AHRC can support individuals build their capacity and confidence to conduct research. One of the immediate outcomes of this project has been the announcement of the joint AHRC ROUK Professional Practice Fellowship Scheme, which is aimed specifically at meeting this challenge, providing five funded fellowships to enable library colleagues to take time out of their substantive role in order to develop their research capacity and expertise. Um, and the deadline's today, so you've only got a few hours if you're considering putting in your application. RUK and HRC have also announced the creation of a research engagement scheme, which is there to support colleagues from a very early stage of their research uh, ambitions and guiding them through uh, the process of creating a research application to an academic funder. And this programme will formally be announced and launched from January of next year. We've also been exploring some of the opportunities to foster uh, uh, sort of knowledge sharing and relationships between and within institutions. And today is a part of that process, sharing our experience and knowledge across the community. We've also, and something the report highlights, is the need for greater library representation within some funding conversations and discussions. And this is also something we'll be working on. There's a great deal and work to be done in terms of individual institutions, in terms of their internal processes to celebrate research of library staff, and also a need to change uh, the culture, not only within individual institutions and how libraries engage and see their own research, but also across the wider sector. And once again, all of the recommendations are outlined in the report. Now, just to conclude, I thought I'd offer a few brief re uh, reflections in terms of some of the ongoing conversations which have continued to emerge since the report was published in June. One of the things that I think we may touch on today is, is the role of the library as laboratory. And this is uh, a phrase that many UK colleagues will be familiar with, libraries as labs and as places of experimentation. And the positioning of many of our libraries as laboratories for the arts and humanities, particularly using this phraseology as libraries reopen and reopened uh, following the uh, periods of national lockdown in the UK and the positioning of libraries as laboratories almost in parallel to those laboratories within the science sciences on university campuses meaning that libraries opened at the same time for example as science laboratories um, and were, were treated with a degree of, uh, of, uh, of similarity that the pandemic has offered us an opportunity to challenge some of the key perceptions of libraries uh, as buildings with books, which was a stubborn, um, a, a stubborn image amongst a small group of our users, which we've been uh, able to challenge through the experience of the pandemic and the resilience and strength of our digital infrastructure and collections. Emerging services that have come from the pandemic, such as virtual reading rooms, which offer remote, humanly mediated virtual access to collections through the use of visualizers and links, with search room staff being in on site, whereas a user is viewing a document through a visualizer off site, have further emphasized the skills and the expertise of library colleagues and have positioned them as almost research assistants and potential research partners uh, from the outset. And this is an area where RUK is conducting uh, research. 
And that is really what I wanted to finish on and just put a link on screen to a survey that we're currently undertaking around the development and expansion of virtual reading rooms as research services um, and the experience of libraries of developing these during the pandemic. This is a survey which is open to all colleagues to complete, including non uk members. So please, if you are doing work around virtual reading rooms, we'd very much encourage you to complete this survey. So very quickly, that was a brief overview of some of the work that REK has been undertaking with the AHRC and evidence base. Um, this is really just to highlight the excitement and the potential and the strength of academic and research libraries as research partners, the diversity of their contribution, the fact that this is diversifying and there is a great deal of optimism in terms of how libraries can cement and develop their role as research partners. But there are barriers, but our UK and the AHRC and other colleagues are committed to working together to overcome some of these. And the report, as you see published on the REUK website, is an invitation to all of you to engage with our UK and our partners as we explore this exciting topic together. So thank you very much. And um, I want to hand back to Torsten and Evald. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, that's very interesting, also very helpful for us in Germany. Um, we have a number of reports and recommendations, of course, but I think you are uh, doing much more in the field of, of um, uh, doing investigations and writing reports and setting up schemes and, and action plans, etc. cetera. Um, so thanks very much again. Um, are there any questions or comments? Not at this point, that's fine. Um, you can always uh, ask questions later on. Uh, Sie können natürlich auch später noch Fragen stellen oder Kommentare uh, in den Chat schreiben. Uh, kein Problem, wir sind noch ein bisschen Aufsendung. Um, okay, uh, well then, uh, let me introduce my colleague Ellen Reil. Ellen Reil is the Deputy Director at, of the University and State Library Saxony-Anhalt at Halle. And she will talk about tiny office houses and GIS laboratories at Martin Luther University at Halle. Um, and that because uh, the University and State Library regularly receives maps in print and also in digital formats um, because uh, they, the library gets them as a uh, deposit copy. And the library also has a specific building for its historical map collections. And that building is currently being renovated and when the renovation is, is done, um, in the future, they will have new facilities and also new services for students and scientists. But let me now hand over to Ellen, who will give you more details on this project. Ellen, please. Yeah, thank you, Ebert, for the friendly introduction. So. I think now we can start. Can everybody see? Yeah, the sheet. Okay. Yeah, I'm giving this lecture in representation of Anke Berko Sprengel, who has other appointments today. So I hope I um, will can, or can answer all your questions in the end. I would like to report um, on a project that we have been planning at University and State Library Saxony Anhalt for some time, and we hope um, to be able to implement soon. But first, I will start with some facts of the university. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, the so-called, now called Martin Luther University Halle-Wittenberg um, was founded in 1696. Um, nowadays, um, we have more than 20,000 students spread across 259 different graduate courses um, in, in Halle. It has around 4,000 staff members, amongst them more than 260 professors and 14 so-called junior professors, which um, is a German um, position. Um, outstanding young scientists um, are given um, early independence and autonomy in research and, teach and teaching. 
The university budget amounts to 155.8 million euros um, and 60.2 million euros um, uh, budget of the other budget of the faculty of medicine. In addition, uh, numerous non-university research and scientific institutions are lo uh, located in Halle. This includes the National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, as well as the Franke Foundations and several research institutes of um, the major scientific societies in Germany. As to mention, the Max Planck Society, Fraunhofer Society, Helmholtz Society and the Leibniz Association. The University and State Library of Saxony Anhalt was founded in 1696, two years after the University of Halle. And in the, at the beginning, the stocks were housed in two rooms in a building near the marketplaces. The library had no regular budget, and so new items came mostly as gifts or inheritances of professors, uh, citizens of Halle. In 1712, the library gained its first legal deposit right. All printers and publishers of the city of Halle had to give the library one copy of every printed work, and this also included maps. The right was extended to the so-called Prussian province of Saxony in 1824, and by the way, it still exists today for publishers from all over the federal state of Saxony-Anhalt. Um, with the unification of the two universities, Halle and Wittenberg, which is a small town uh, in the north of Saxony-Anhalt um, in 1817, two important collections, the so-called Hungarian lab Library and the Pony Cow Collection came to Halle. Over the years, many important collections were added, such as the Library of the German Oriental Society and others. In 1880, the main building portrait on this picture was completed and houses most of the important collections until today. Nowadays, the University and State Library is the biggest scientific general library in the federal state of Saxony-Anhalt. More than 5.5 million holdings are distributed over the main library and the 12 branch libraries. This includes more than 22,000 ongoing um, journals in print or electronic form, as well as uh, 285 micro-materials. Some of the branch libraries and readings, reading rooms can be seen um, on this and the following slides. With a total of 180,000 items, the University and State Library has the largest inventory of maps in the federal state of Saxony-Anhalt and is one of the 10 largest uh, collections um, of this type in Germany. In accordance with the library's remit, maps of central Germany in general and Saxony-Anhalt in particular are collected as comprehensively as possible. The historical inventory of old map contains a large number of prints by important cartographers uh, from the 16th to 18th century including maps by Nicolas Sanson, Johannes Jansonius or Petrus Schenk for the experts and from the publishers Seuter and Romanche Erben uh, with a regional focus in Saxony and Thuringia. The library just started a digitization project with historical maps of Saxony-Anhalt and more than 500 items um, are currently available at the institutional repository. The map collection is stored in a Wilhelminian style villa. This is a listed building in the back of the central library um, ground. You can see it on the, um, the university's main, or the library's main building is um, on the left. Um, and the map collection building is on the right side of the picture. Um, it was built in, the map collection building was built in 1890 as a residential building for a professor. It was later bought by a Jewish merchant. In the 1930s, it was expropriated by the Nazi government and passed into the ownership of it, the Department of Education. In one part of the building, the library later opened the newspaper room. In the 1960s, the director of the University and State Library took official residence on the upper floor of this building. Nowadays, the map collection is the exclusive user of the building and is largely limited to the ground floor. Because the building is partially damaged and the restoration is urgently needed. In 2020, the university submitted an application to the state government for the restoration of the building with European Regional Development Funds, ERDF, in Germany, this EFRE. Um, in January 2021, we learned that our application was the only one to be recommended by the government of Saxony-Anhalt due to a convincing concept for a research facility building. For this reason, we hope to receive a positive response in 20, uh, 2022. 
So what are we planning? Um, due to the fact uh, that cartographic materials are of particular importance for science, economy and politics and that around 80% of all activities and decisions in this area have a spatial reference, we would like to use the building to bring these groups together. At Martin Luther University, numerous institutes and departments deal with spatial data and use maps for the basis of their works. First of all, the geosciences deal with spatial processes within the geosphere. Applied biological disciplines examine the spatial distribution of plants and animals and in the medical sciences, the spatial spreading of pathogens is being studied. Research in the humanities often has spatial components too. An example, the visualization of archaeological sites or historical events. In addition to university and research institutions, public and administration institutions such as road construction or nature conservation, uh, also use map materials for their work. And finally, map users can be found at small and medium-sized enterprises in the state of Saxony-Anhalt. This includes, for example, architectural offices um, that use historical maps to document changes in urban development um, or the landscape. Companies that deal with the management of geospatial data also use maps for product development for applications um, that are used worldwide, such as software for navigation and environment search systems in various contexts. Digital map information is playing an increasingly important role in these processes. In many cases, there are no longer any printed version of certain maps and therefore no longer any static representations. Instead, maps are constantly being newly created from databases in digital form and are therefore subject to a dynamic process. The enrichment of geospatial information with sociological, historical, medical, or other specialist data requires a high level of media competence, both from the product developers in the scientific institution and from the end users. And to support um, research and development, the University and State Library of Saxony and I would like to add a MAPS research center to its services. In the renovated villa, rooms are now to be set up for the provision of printed maps as well as digital data. Two um, GIS laboratories are to be the central component. In these, the natural science and humanities disciplines should be given the opportunity to network closely. Scientists from the fields mentioned have already expressed their great interest in, interest in holding courses at the research center. University-wide educational offers are to be created in cooperation with the experts from the University Center of Multimedia Teaching and Learning. In addition, external researchers and interested SMEs should be able to work in the GIS laboratories. For companies in the field of geographic information processing, the researcher is to offer map tools for setting up powerful mapping and location-based analysis functions. The products created there are to be supported by training courses of the provision of, the provision of geospatial data. The aim of this project is to bring um, science and business together by strengthening the technological and business sectors in saxony Anhalt in the long term. This slide um, shows some of the planned services. In addition to providing hard and software, the tasks of such a GIS laboratory include the services technical conversation of research data into GIS advice and support for the procurement of spatial data, um, courses in various disciplines, uh, and uh, providing working spaces for external researchers as SMEs, as to mention some of them. We have another project. Um, the development of the MAPS Research Center is to go hand in hand with an upgrading of the library area in its vicinity. vicinity sorry. The central library location only has a general reading room as it is built in 1880. Individual or group work rooms are completely absent but are essential nowadays. Therefore, the project also includes plans to set up some so-called tiny houses in Germany. I don't know if uh, it's the right word in, in English. Um, small garden um, houses as learning spaces. Therefore, the project also includes um, um, tiny houses, individual or group working spaces between the library, um, the main library and the map collection building. For those working in the new spaces, library support, as well as infrastructural services, such as printers, toilets, coffee machines, are available in the nearby main building and the MAPS Research Center. 
Um, we have also um, secured a sponsor for this um, project. He suggested asking the Halle-based Arts College for the design and um, planning of the working spaces and the employment of uh, handicapped workers via a specialized company in Halle for the construction of this premises. And these are some of the examples for tiny houses or garden rooms which can be installed in the garden. We are very curious to see whether our plans can be realized in the new future and that brings me to the end of my lecture. So I'll hand back to Thorsten and Edward. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. For, oh, sorry. Very much. Yeah, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, tiny ha houses, also kleine Häuser, uh, sehr interessanter Gedanke. Uh, Thorsten. Yeah, I also want to say thank you. And just to quickly note, uh, there have now been uh, questions linked to uh, to Matt's talk in the chat. I suggest we'll keep all of those and we'll bring all the general questions up uh, later in the um, um, in the discussion at the end when we can, and we'll no doubt go back to all the calls. Just wanted to say this. If you have any questions about something that maybe only now popped into your head, just put them into the chat and Eva and I will do our best to uh, um, to pick them up. Um, I've also seen in the chat there were some concerns about the sound. It's been okay for me and from what I hear from some others. But if any of you have problems with the sound, uh, just let us know. And maybe there, there's anything that we can do. Um, sorry for that little logistics interlude. Um, I, if I may, I have a quick question building, I think, on the theme that Matt um, mentioned. I think to me, really, that's that's a crucial one. It's um, the perception of libraries and whether we are seen as uh, sort of facilitators or genuinely as, uh, as partners. Uh, and could you say a little bit sort of from your experience in, in the university, how the engagement of the academic community is going what, and what they are sort of looking for from the library? Is it mostly just access to content? Are they open to really bringing libraries in more into their research? Um, be interesting to hear a bit more about your experience. Yeah, I think it's an increasingly an, int an increasingly interest in a library uh, as a partner um, for um, helping them to um, gain pr projects uh, from um, for data um, storage and um, sometimes they have to do. Um, I'm sorry. I mentioned it before, I'm really nervous, <laughs> so my English is uh, not bad, in, uh, really bad in the moment. Um, we have some problems, uh, or we have, um, can I continue in, in German? Sorry, Ewald, would you please translate? <laughs> Okay, also es geht im Prinzip ja darum, dass die DFG ähm, auch ja, fordert, dass wir Datenmanagementpläne oder dass die Wissenschaftler Datenmanagementpläne ähm, vorlegen und wir an der Stelle dann tatsächlich ähm, mit dabei sind und beraten. Und ich weiß nicht, wir haben einen Kollegen hier mit im Hause äh, oder mit in der Runde, den Herrn äh, Dr. Kosatl, der damit genau befasst ist mit dem Open Science Team. Und vielleicht kann ich auf ihn verweisen, dass er noch ein bisschen was dazu sagt. Just a short uh, kind of translation. Um, Ellen mentioned that um, one of the funding agencies like uh, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft requires um, uh, uh, data management plans and, and um, themes and, and concepts for dealing with, uh, with research data. And that's when very often libraries are coming in now. Uh, because uh, many libraries also at Halle, um, Hild Hildesheim as well, and I know from many, many other libraries in Germany, uh, they're building up uh, uh, know-how and expertise in dealing with research data. And uh, we at, at Hildesheim see more and more researchers and scholars um, approaching us and asking us for help. And uh, that has been um, a very, uh, very good experience. Uh, also very, uh, uh, very exhausting <laughs> at times, uh, but I think it's, it's really worthwhile and it's important that we um, also make clear we, 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 we ourselves see us as, as partners and not only as uh, service providers. So. 
Yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I think my original question was on it, the key point that also Matt raised in the report about librarians not just seen as say, information providers, but as genuine partners in research. And I was interested to hear what's uh, in the university, what's the perception of the library? How do you find sort of working with academics? Is there more interest in that kind of partnership? Okay, thank you. Thank you again for repeating the question. Yes, indeed, I think, um, there's an increasing interest um, uh, from our scientific uh, staff to get involved. And, and I think you were just mentioning in your report uh, something which we see here too, um, that the expectation that the library should play a role in supporting some of this research uh, is, is, is there. And uh, what we have to do now is to make sure that the process uh, this is a long process, so we have to transform the library, we have to run many internal uh, sort of uh, restructuring processes to make sure that we can provide a support. And so I think this is going from sort of changing the way certain departments within the libraries function to making sure that we have the appropriate training for our staff to, to meet these demands. And so I myself, I'm a biologist, and so I'm sort of within my librarian colleagues here. And so I think, you know, I think this is your, this is some of the changes that are taking now part. And so I support the natural scientists here, but I have other colleagues who support the social and the humanities too. And so I think this is part of a big sort of important change which definitely needs to be supported. And we are happy to, you know, be part of this process. And this is, this is, kind of what we can, that's a status from, from Pilot. Um, but we definitely are uh, really involved in, in, in supporting uh, researchers with, with uh, um, our infrastructure, but uh, definitely with uh, uh, supporting them with their research data management plans. Great, um, thank you both. Um, that was really interesting. Um, do we have any other immediate questions on the presentation? Bearing in mind that we have plenty of time later on for a broad discussion across all of the, uh, these themes. I don't see anything in the chat or any hand up. So I would just suggest that we move on to your next task and then we can, we can get back to all these themes in the, um, in the discussion at the end. So our next presentation uh, is from two colleagues from the National Library of Scotland. Um, we have Sarah Ames, who's a digital scholarship librarian and Chris Fleet, who's a map curator. There will be a map theme to this. And it was partly, I think, coincidence and partly a little bit by design that we thought um, if, we did, if we have an organization like the National Library of Scotland that does a lot in this space anyway, that also has to have, happens to uh, <clears throat> happens to have an interesting map collection, then uh, there could be some themes. But I, I think there's a there's a much broader question here in terms of the collaboration with academics and the potential that our collections and and also digital services bring here. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over uh, to Chris and uh, Sarah for your presentation. Thank you, Torsten. I'll just share my screen now. Um, here we go. I hope you can see this okay. Um, yeah, great. I'll just get it going now. Okay, so um, thank you again, Torsten, um, and thank you, RLEK. Um, I'm Sarah Ames. I'm the Digital Scholarship Librarian at the National Library of Scotland. Um, as Torsten said, I'll be talking with my colleague Chris Fleet, who's our map curator, about research collaborations that are, that are taking place at the National Library of Scotland. So I'm afraid I don't have the language skills of our colleagues here um, to speak two different languages fluently, so you're getting a straightforward English presentation from me. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about our digital scholarship service um, for the first half of this talk, and then I'll, ha then I'll hand over to Chris, who'll be able to discuss our map service. So first, I'm going to give you a really brief and broad overview of um, some of the relevant work happening at the National Library of Scotland at the moment. Um, so we're currently working to a one third digital strategic aim by 2025. Um, this is involving a lot of digitisation, particularly map digitisation, which I'm sure Chris will mention. Um, and this, of course, is giving a lot of opportunities for digital research, um, but also leaving us a lot of challenges on how to present digital materials for different audiences, what our different audiences needs are, what can be done with these collections and so on. Um, 
the collection has now reached over 31 million items. So there's loads of opportunities here for exploration. And our new strategy, which is called Reaching People, it's just been launched, has a strong focus on research partnerships, on digital scholarship, and on engaging new audiences through um, our research and, and through our services. Um, okay, so part of this work has enabled the creation of a new digital scholarship service, uh, which has now been around for about two years. Um, so the service has got five main objectives. I won't talk through all of these, um, but they're there on the screen for you to see. Um, a big focus of our initial work has been on the research community. And, and to be honest, it's where the current expertise is, it's where the funding is, um, it's where we can contribute skills and expertise usefully, but also where we can gain an understanding of how best to present our collections for greatest reuse and usefulness. So we can learn a lot from the research community as well. Um, so the collaborations that I'll highlight in this talk fall in line with three of our aims around encouraging computational methods with the collections, around ensuring that our collections are being used to their full potential. So we want to encourage both analog and digital research with our collections. We see them as complementary um, to one another. Um, and also around anticipating the future of research and ex exploring what, uh, with others what, what tools and techniques and methods might be around the corner, um, thinking about how we can anticipate our user needs and how we can present our collections in ways that will stand the test of time. So our collaborations fall into a few broad but, but not fixed categories. Um, so, so in general, I'd say that we provide um, collections expertise for projects um, with further understanding of the collections in question. Uh, we provide technical work around making collections available, but also advising on what technologies can be used with them and using them ourselves and trialing different tools and techniques as part of collaboration. Um, we also work on funded partnerships, and this is really where we'd be able to contribute more staff time towards downing tools and, and working on a single um, project um, and um, where we could explore um, new tools and technologies and, and concepts around our, around our collections in a bit more detail. Um, we also find that having a network of academics and others to collaborate with and knowing their areas of interest is really useful. So sometimes we have these slow burning projects where we're working with an academic um, over a long period of time and, and knowing their interests and, and working with them, we gradually um, uncover areas of um, worthy of further research with them. And um, at other times an opportunity simply comes up and we need to be nimble and flexible enough to adapt accordingly. And that happens a lot in digital scholarship, I'd say just things come about and we have to, to quickly divert resources. So relationships really are key and understanding um, where we need to go for certain input and certain expertise is really important. So um, we've got three main areas of activity for our digital scholarship service, um, making data available is the first one, and that's through our Data Foundry platform. Um, you can see it on the screen there with the link. Um, the second area of activity is external engagement and partnership. And then the third is internal engagement within the library. So I thought what I'd do is highlight a few of the partnerships that have been taking place under the banner of the Digital Scholarship Service over the past two years. Um, so firstly, I wanted to talk about um, traditional research collaborations. Um, so first up is our annual fellowship. We're actually advertising for the, the next round of our fellowship at the moment. So please um, do share any information about this um, that you can. Um, the aim of this is to work with researchers on a three month project using our data foundry collections, our data sets, um, to encourage use of the collections, further the researchers work, but also to gain new understanding for the library. So our first fellow was Dr. Giles Burgle from the University of Oxford, who we worked with to make our chapbooks data set available. Um, he then used computer vision tools and techniques to identify the illustrations within chapbooks with the aim of exploring the provenance of illustrations and the reuse of woodblocks in chapbooks in this period and in this geographical region. And we're hoping to continue working with him now on how to make a data set of these illustrations available um, for reuse on our data foundry, um, which will enable further research into this collection um, and further understanding from our point of view in the library too as to what's in the collection. Um, our current fellow is Dr. Rosa Filguera, who's creating an AI toolbox for use with our data foundry data sets, enabling our users to explore huge collections without the need for coding skills. Um, so we're currently working on our Encyclopedia Britannica data set as a starting point here, with Rosa working to extract individual articles and terms within the encyclopedia. And the library is providing curatorial expertise about the encyclopedia. We're providing relevant metadata and file formats um, to enable this work to happen. So um, we're in touch a lot with Rosa about how we can make the next steps in this project. Um, we're also involved in the creation of a text and data min mining platform with uh, Rosa and also Professor Melissa Terrace using ours and others collections. Um, this has involved the library providing expertise around file formats, around copyright, around um, 
the, the idea of cultural heritage collections data um, itself and, um, and the challenges around it. And a pilot platform is currently being created to enable large scale analysis of the collections. And this platform when complete will also enable new forms of research into our collections. So that's a bit of an ongoing theme here is that research is spawning future research. The Digital Scholarship Service also has two collaborative doctoral partnerships. Um, so Joe Knuckles is exploring how transcribers will change library and archival practice. And we're currently, or we're shortly going to start working with him on a placement and how the library might be able to embed transcribers into our digitization workflow and what opportunities there may be for us um, using transcribers with other collections as well. And we also have Ash Charlton, another student who's just started researching slavery and race in our Encyclopedia Britannica dataset. And we'll be working with her on how to explore um, and how to approach the legacies of slavery that are embedded within our information sources and what tools and approaches we can use to explore and acknowledge this, um, this really challenging issue. Um, so this, these are both really good examples of opportunistic and slow burning projects. So transcribers came our way at really short notice. We were keen and uh, we were keen to be using the, the tool and really interested in exploring it for a while. Um, and a funding opportunity came our way to lead some research with one of the top academics in the field for this. So we weren't going to pass it by. And, and luckily, we've now got Joe working on this with us. Um, Britannica with Ash, meanwhile, um, was a slow burner. So it actually came about off the work from the previous slide, the text and data mining platform. And um, so research has created further research. Um, and, and this project was the result of a couple of years of conversations with Melissa Terrace about um, how valuable some work could be into this collection um, on this theme. And um, we did some exploratory work, so did Melissa and her team. And then we've gradually worked this up into a PhD studentship proposal. So it's taken a few years to get that one off the ground. Here's a sneak preview of another collaboration that we're soon to publicize. So we haven't yet done this one. Um, so just before lockdown, um, the library worked with Dr. Asad Khan, who was then a PhD student at Edinburgh University, to create some LIDAR point cloud data of our main George IV Bridge building. Um, so as well as providing very practical work here about, around access to buildings, for example, security reviews about which areas we could and couldn't include within the scanning, We've also been working on how to release this as a data set, and, and I'm, I'm working on this at the moment um, with colleagues. Um, Asad, in the meantime, has also been rendering the data into these amazing eerie visualizations that you can see here. This one's of our reading room. Um, here's um, the stairs that go down under our George IV Bridge building into the um, subterranean stacks that we have underneath the, the road. Um, and here are the stacks themselves. So I guess here is how you digitize all the books, you LIDAR them. Um, soon we'll be releasing um, this data set and we'll be seeking further collaborations, exploring uses of that as well. I can see really great examples of uses, perhaps with video games, for example. There's some really great opportunities here. So I'm excited to be releasing this one soon. So next up, I wanted to mention postgraduate teaching and learning. Um, now, I know this is about research, but we, we teach informally on a number of courses, and we also collaborate on postgraduate uh, research projects within these courses, too. Um, and that includes a data visualization course at the University of Edinburgh. So on this course, um, students learn how to create data visualizations using our collections. Um, so we teach about collections as data and how they become data and what the challenges of working with cultural heritage data are. And then we set challenges for the students around different data sets and we work with them on research projects to interpret and create visualizations um, of them. Um, so the work has always been unbelievably creative. It's, it's shown our collections from whole new perspectives. And this one has involved putting Encyclopedia Britannica into Minecraft and then navigating on a roller coaster as you do. Um, so I hope this is going to work and that you'll hear the sound okay, but I'll show you a short clip now and hopefully you can hear it. Pause that there. I hope you could hear the sound okay. Um, so in the actual Minecraft world, you can go up and click on the trees here, for example, learn more about chemistry in the, in the encyclopedia. And the, the roller coaster goes on to navigate through various other worlds. And I hope you'll agree, it's actually quite a beautiful thing they've created. I think it's, it's really creative. It's something that is turning our, our idea of collections on their heads, um, something that we'd never have thought of when it comes to Britannica. 
Um, so we've also worked with students on a design with data course, exploring how to creatively interpret data sets for a public exhibition. Um, so taking our collections to new audiences, and that's very important for our new library strategy that um, research can then um, be taken to public audiences and have public use as well. Um, so we taught on this course also, but we um, worked with students to select data sets um, and topics that could be explored in new ways for a public audience. And there was a nighttime exhibition that was held over the course of the summertime this year. Um, and it's a nice immediate example, I think, of how research projects have public benefits. There's different collections here being um, shown in, in really creative ways um, on, a, on a main street in Edinburgh. And we've also made data available for Dr. B. Alex um, to use in the creation of a text and data mining carpentry class um, and suggested areas um, to explore within this collection, um, a medical history of British India. Uh, we've provided curatorial input into what research questions could be relevant. Um, so that one should be released soon too. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to highlight um, I'm going to be very quick now because I know that Chris is due to speak soon, but I'm going to highlight a few ways in which we've been working with artists. And I see this as another form of research collaboration. So we collaborate beyond the traditional research community. and We've had some great experiences so far with this. So we've had two artists in residence now. Um, we worked with our first Martin Disley to identify collections that could be suitable for use with GAN, Generative Adversarial Network Techniques, so a form of AI. And then we learned from his needs and uses on how best to present these collections going forwards and what volume of images he would need and so on. So he started by trialing the techniques with our Tay and Fourth Bridges collections. So the Fourth Bridge um, collection is the one that we use to, to publicize our data foundry. Um, and he's um, created these eerie kind of mangled metal bridges, which is um, quite fitting given the nature of particularly the Tay Bridge disaster originals. Um, so after that experiment, he then moved on to his main project using maps at scale. And this was thanks to Chris's work in making the maps available. Um, his final project, um, this is Martin's final project, um, was um, to explore the idea of the truth of the map alongside the truth or not of AI. And these are, these are maps that are versions of Scotland that, and that versions of a Scotland that never existed. Um, you can even see the slightly wonky compasses there on the screen on some of the blocks which the model has generated. Our current artist, Marion Carey, is asking similar questions about our broadsides collection, comparing the construction of an archive um, to the construction of truth itself. And her platform's currently live and available to interact with if you want to have a go, the, the link is there on the screen. Um, and so she's worked with curators and other library professionals to um, understand the challenges and the issues that are facing libraries at the moment around technologies, around this digital shift. Um, and she's worked it up um, into this creative project using our data sets. Um, so all of these projects are featured on our projects page and um, they've all been partnerships in various interpretations of the term so from providing technical work and contextual understanding to um, also providing new ideas to providing teaching um, and to providing very specific input about our collections um, we've also gained and we've grown significantly from our work with these academics and students and artists so we haven't only learned about user needs but we've also learned how to present our data in new ways that's easiest and most relevant for different audiences and um, we've expanded our understanding of the collections and what they contain and we've had our idea of items and collections turned on their heads as i said in, in creative and, and unexpected ways so our digital scholarship partnerships so far have been a fresh, a, a breath of fresh air um, and of, of mutual benefit for both library and collaborator. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Chris now, um, who's going to talk you through some of the collaborations happening around our map collections. Thank you very much. There's my contact details on the screen and here's over to Chris. I'll stop sharing now. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. I hope you can uh, hear me and hopefully uh, see my screen as well. Thank you, Torsten. So uh, thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. And my talk will be uh, another fairly brief overview, uh, in this case of our map activities, which have generated what we might call research commons uh, content, as well as academic collaborations of different types over the last decade. And I'd like to begin with a brief introduction to our online digital maps and I ask before then looking at these research commons activities. So looking at the ways in which IIIF has been used for annotation and georeferencing, sharing the code for our map viewers and geospatial metadata and web services. And then I'll spend a little more time looking at georeference layers and web services, which 
I think have been our main digital commons activities. And then finish up by looking at some of the recent and current projects, extracting map features and vectorization. So just to give um, a little flavor, of some of our maps, the earliest maps of Scotland, hand drawn by Timothy Pont four centuries ago, marked the beginning of detailed Scottish map making. And the largest Scottish towns were mapped from the 16th century onwards. We also hold things like uh, estate plans, which can show things like landscape improvement and clearance. We've also got historic collections of their photographs. Ordnance Survey Map Britain from the early 19th century. And these are by far the largest and most heavily consulted of all our collections. And they allow detailed chronologies of landscape change to be viewed through successive editions. And uh, putting this collection online has been my main job for the last two decades. And we now have 250,000 maps online, which is about 15% of our collection. So there's still a long way to go. And the usage of the website has grown significantly over time. So we have over 2 million users annually, 4 million user sessions, and over 18 million page views. This translates every day to around 12,000 user sessions and 60,000 page views. So a large and growing global audience. And technology allows continued improvements in helping people find everything easily online, which is really one of our highest priorities. We've used open source viewers for the last decade, as well as created things like bounding box envelopes for all of our online maps, because location or map-based search methods are the primary way for people to find them. And the geo-referenced viewers are by far the most popular area of the website uh, here looking in detail at Cambridge a century ago, and they allow through things like a transparency slider for transparency to be faded uh, to compare them to modern day satellite or map images. It's possible for the maps also to be viewed side by side or swiped. There's also quite fun ways of presenting them, for example, through a spyglass a uh, viewer, or combining the maps with elevation data uh, to create a 3D viewer. I have to say this kind of technology looks more impressive for those parts of Great Britain that go up and down uh, a bit more. Now, just to move on to look at the various ways that this content, both images and metadata, can contribute to research commons. And we'll look at the first uh, three of these subjects quite swiftly. Uh, IIIF, allowing ways of sharing images, code for sharing viewers, and web services for sharing metadata. And as with other libraries and other images in NLS, we've used the IIIF image API in recent years and also make the reuse of it much more clear recently uh, with a tab, uh, a show triple IF tab on every map page. And this makes it easy to bring zoomable triple IF images into other websites and software, including things like Recogito for text transcription. Another recent and interesting development is the All Maps project. Uh, being developed by Bert Spahn in the Netherlands, which allows any triple IF map image to be manually geo-referenced online and walked into position using the Open uh, World Wide Web Consortium annotation specification. And this allows quite exciting new opportunities for open uh, crowdsource geo-referencing. Secondly, um, briefly, we share all the code behind our web mapping application, some viewers on, on GitHub, 
which are, these are all based on open source technologies, mostly open layers, and we're keen to help others to use them if they would like to. And a number of academic projects have done this over the years, hopefully saving a little development time. And the code is usually explained with annotations and help notes, allowing the viewers or applications to be freely downloaded as working examples. We also make available the metadata behind our online maps, which is primarily map sheet, date and location information. And our map search viewers all use the Open Geospatial Consortium's web feature service specification, which allows a dynamic query to be made of our map metadata. And quite recent, Exciting use of this has been made by Olivia Vane of the British Library and Turing Institute. She's used it to try and visualize ordnance surveys mapping over time. So this uh, image shows on the left-hand side uh, the progress of ordnance survey and mapping Scotland for just one series, whilst the right-hand image shows her what she's called her macro map observable notebook, which allows many different ways of visualizing ordnance survey maps over time using what she's called a small multiples uh, approach. Now, I admit it's rather a mesmerizing slide, but it's trying to show the animation behind Olivia's uh, graphics and also to show that metadata, as well as being really the bedrock of everything we put online, can be transformed creatively into new graphics. So let's move on to look at uh, georeferenced web services. And as you may know, georeferencing for uh, most of our series maps crops away the margins of the maps and assigns geographical coordinates to them so that they can be located in the real world and presented as an overlay. Um, and because we use uh, an open standard, the web map tile service standard for making available uh, layers, they can be easily used inside other websites. And this has a huge value for other research purposes. So on the, uh, the right-hand side, the graphic tries to show how this WMTS standard allows large maps to be tiled into small pixel images following the same projection and specification that Google and Bing and OpenStreetMap all use. And so it enables them to be viewed, not just very fast over the web, but also inside other websites and software. So these two OGC, open standards are of crucial importance for sharing spatial data. The WFS, the Web Feature Service for sharing data sets as features, and the WMTS for data sets holders, raster images. A decade ago, we launched our Historic Maps API, which provides a way of embedding an historic georeference map of England, Scotland, and Wales from the 1920s inside another website. And the example on the right is uh, from the University of Warwick, illustrating it in action as a background map layer to a search interface for using resources relating to the general strike using the Google Maps API. This has been very popular over the years, and we've continued to make other layers available uh, for some of these large layers, heavily used layers, recouping the costs of this through a subscription process. And they've been used for things like viewing historic place names of Wales um, or in historic environment Scotland's CanMap interface. This is for viewing scheduled monuments in Scotland. Another uh, more recent example is as a background layer to a website on mapping the Scottish Reformation. We've recently scanned and georeferenced historic maps of India to support a research project in water resources in the Coimbatore environs, the, the Cavery River Basin in southern India. And these show things like the, the Cavery River before and after the construction of the Meta Dam, which began in 1934. Uh, many of the 
previous perennial reservoirs uh, or water tanks are now dry, but their locations can be revealed through georeferencing historic maps. And these maps are currently being researched by two students, one in India and another in Lancaster as part of a wider digital humanities research project. In uh, 2015, we put online detailed maps of Jamaica by James Robertson, uh, pictured here, who was a Shetlander. He traveled to Jamaica in the 1770s and he spent the next two decades there working as a surveyor, uh, as well as a slave plantation owner. And we made available uh, geo-referenced mapping when we put his maps online in 2015. And because the geo-reference mapping is a web service, it can be used by others, including the legacies of British slave ownership project. And they used our geo-reference mapping of Jamaica to position records relating to estates and their slave owners back in Britain. So, this collaboration and use of our geo-reference mapping as a web service allowed the records to be geolocated on top of a, an, um, an, an appropriate historical map from the relevant time period and shows how making available our map in this way allows it to be repurposed, uh, making information about slavery available to a wider audience combined with other data sets. Moving on uh, to look at projects involving extracting data through crowdsourcing. And in general, we've been very keen to develop these uh, projects more recently to try to become something of a geodata hub. And the aim is to focus on geodata connected to our map collections. And one area of work has been the creation of detailed gazetteers. The NLS was a partner in the GB1900 project, which successfully crowdsourced all the place names on detailed ordnance survey maps of a century ago covering Great Britain. And on the, uh, the right-hand side, you can see how we could map the progress of recorded names over time and the project completed in early 2018, um, having recorded an amazing two and a half million confirmed names. And these names can all be freely downloaded from the Vision of Britain website. And there have been many onward uses of the data set so far. We've also made available the, the names as a searchable historic uh, gazetteer in our Explore Georeferenced Maps viewer. Uh, many of our users are interested in historic names for places often that don't exist today. They're not in modern day gazetteers, such as this place, Libby Skarnik, which uh, was by the, the bottom end of Loch Lyon, but following the, uh, the enlargements of Loch Lyon in the 1930s is there no more. And it's also possible to query the GB1900 data to reveal distributions of particular features, for example, footpaths. There, there are in fact over 300,000 F.P. footpath abbreviations, which GB1900 recorded. And early last year, the Ramblers took this distribution and launched a new crowdsourcing viewer as part of their Don't Lose Your Way project. And like many of these crowdsourcing projects, it was, uh, it was very successful, it completed fast, um, and the traced paths could uh, be seen in the viewer on the right-hand side. Uh, finally, just to look quickly at uh, the computational analysis of collections, extracting features using machines. And uh, I should stress in, in many of these collaborations, our role in NLS has been primarily supplying the historic maps and suggestions of what could be done with them. And it's really other people or institutions that have done the clever work of applying the machine learning. One recent collaboration has been with the Registers of Scotland on a project to create 
vector outlines of buildings from large scale historic maps. And this project achieved a good success, I would say, at a basic level in identifying buildings. You can see this to the, the left hand side. But as ever, at the moment, quite a number of false positives or buildings that were missed. And it still required a fair amount of manual work to create a vector layer approximating these, these buildings. But I'm sure um, progress will continue to be made on that front. We've also been working more actively in the last year with Edinburgh University master's students in mathematics who, like Martin Disley, who Sarah mentioned, have been using generative adversarial networks to identify symbols and texts. And we hope this will be more actively explored through a PhD collaboration that will begin next year, looking at trees in urban areas. Recent work at the Turing Institute, the Living with Machines project, has been using data science and computational techniques to look at the history of industrialization in 19th century Britain using our maps. And uh, this shows a, a synthetic map which was generated using OpenStreetMap to render to a style approximating our historic ordnance survey maps to help identify text and features. A related project has looked at the extension of the railway network, and this has used machine learning techniques to identify symbols and features connected with railways to extract those from maps and then construct representations of the railway network at different points in the 19th century. And a, a third related project, uh, the Machines Reading Maps project, which is ongoing uh, now, this is uh, a collaboration between the Turing Institute and the University of, um, of Minnesota. And this is really aiming to create a semi-automatic workflow for georeferencing maps and transcribing the written content of maps. So down to the, the lower left, it shows the use of Recogito in a, a manual process, bringing in our georeference layers for transcription. What this project's trying to do is to automatically uh, identify those names, bring them into Recogito for correction, because that there, there is still correction required, but it's a faster way of creating machine readable gazetteers. So we hope this will be a very active area in the future, extracting uh, spatial data from our collections through collaborative community projects, working with groups, as well as through computer-based methods. And we plan to use uh, Sarah's data foundry as the main gathering point for these spatial data collections. So that's been quite a fast canter through our various uh, projects. I hope some of these have uh, been of interest and um, I know Sarah and I would be very happy to answer any questions that you may have uh, on those. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Sarah. Uh, very interesting. Uh, and I assume uh, there might be a couple of questions. There are only oh, a few yeah. in the chat already. Um, ah, yeah. Now oh, oh, I see them. OK. Yeah. But also see that um, someone already has the hand up. Maybe we can start with an in-person question uh, from Jan first. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, I uh, I got a question about um, uh, copy protection in in old maps. They they used to um, add fake places, little dead end streets or uh, stuff like that, in order to identify um, um, copycats who uh, didn't um, who just copy copied the 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 maps. Um, how do you identify those in the maps? If you, if yeah, you that, try. 
That's a, that's a good question. It's one, one that I think people have a lot of interest in. It's particularly prevalent, as you say, with a lot of modern spatial data uh, that's generated by commercial companies that they put these trap features into the mapping so that people who are just completely reusing uh, those, those map layers can effectively be caught uh, as infringing copyrights. And I have to say from uh, an NLS perspective, we have no particular connection or interest in any of that in that our main role is really making available our historic maps. And we're actually becoming more and more keen on allowing unfettered uh, reuse of them. So reuse for commercial or non-commercial purposes. And we're not trying to, if you like, trap people in what they, they may be doing. One point that um, might be useful to make, and it, it is uh, one of the differences, I think, between German and British uh, map services, is that within the UK, many higher and further education institutions who want to use modern spatial data, that is, uh, modern detailed mapping for the present day, have benefited for many years from a service called Edina, based at the University of Edinburgh. And and on campuses, people uh, have subscriptions, authenticated access to Edina services that allow downloading, not just of Ordnance Survey, but of other data sets as well. And we in NLS have never sought to compete or, or try to replicate that kind of uh, service. Our, our focus has really been on making available our uh, historical uh, collections. And uh, I think for Edina, the spatial data sets that they're allowing people to uh, reuse have much more control in terms of copyright control on them, even though the main owners of that copyright are not IDENA, but the, the various uh, institutions, Osman Survey or the Hydrographic Office, who make available their, their layer. So I hope that provides something of a, an answer on that one. No, not really. I, I, I wasn't oh. worried about copyright. I was oh, okay. worried about the traps on, on old maps. So right. somebody made up a street in nineteenth cent in a, on a 19th century um, map. How do you now know that this street that is there on the map does not, in fact, belong on the map? Yeah, well, it's become easier through georeferencing, is one answer to that. I think in the past, uh, within Britain, this issue was uh, very rarely employed. Ordnance Survey a century ago uh, allowed fairly unfettered reuse of Ordnance Survey maps. They saw themselves as a public sector institution generating their mapping, and other commercial providers often took Ordnance Survey's mapping quite legitimately, repackaged it up and reused it. And so Ordnance Survey was not on historic maps, putting these historic trap features on them. But a third answer I think I'd say is that all maps are in many ways an art form. None of them, if you like, are a literal facsimile of the landscape. And so whilst at one level, I think people could say, well, that's obviously a false feature and this is something that might be true. In essence, I think if people are looking at the map layer as being to an extent always a falsehood, there isn't really that much of a clear distinction between these. They're simply different ways of representing the, the world out there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. I think that was an interesting discussion on on the map specific part. Um, we had a few questions also sort of linking into this talk and I, I'd like to maybe start picking up one that um, has a sort of more broader application to the question that we um, discussed. It was and specifically, Sarah, direct a uh, view or your part of the talk. Um, and the, the question was how many VTE, I think that probably assumes full-time equivalent or how many staff do you allocate to these fabulous collaborations? How is it part of your organizational structure in the right way? Is it all part of one department or do you temporarily draw in the right colleagues with the necessary expertise? The reason why I've sort of picked this question in general, I think there's probably a broader element to it. If we want to be trusted partners in research collaboration, we need to be able to collaborate. 
and that takes resource and expertise and credibility. And I think a question that I would imagine is probably in many people's minds is, how do you build something like this up? How do you embed it in your organizational structure? And how do you sustain it? So whichever part of those questions, um, maybe starting with Sarah first, but would also be good to hear thoughts from the other panelists. Thank you. Yeah, they're good questions. Um, so I can talk from the point of view of our digital scholarship service, which is only two years old. Um, so, you know, bear with me on this a little bit. Um, I'd say that digital scholarship at the National Library of Scotland is a whole library effort. Um, everybody's involved in various ways from book fetchers who, um, you know, move the books to the digitization studio through to the curators who provide um, collections expertise. Um, in terms of FTE, um, allocated for digital scholarship specifically, that would be um, the role I have at the moment, digital scholarship librarian, I'm lucky to have it. Um, and it's the, the first role we've had of that kind. So we've had it now for two years. Um, so at the second part, I think of, of um, the question is correct that we, we temporarily draw on the right colleagues with the necessary expertise. Um, it's definitely a case I'd say of, it's digital scholarship on a shoestring. Um, so certain, I think Chris would probably agree on, on the maps front, which he's doing amazing work on it. It's still maps work on a shoestring, but it's, it's working for the time being. Um, that's not to say that um, if there were um, relevant funding, um, funding um, calls that came up, that um, we could apply for, um, where we could get in new staff, that would, would be fantastic and we'd definitely be going for them. Um, but at the moment, um, this is how we're, we're generally doing it. So I don't know if Chris wants to add anything um, about the, the collaborations from his side as well. Uh, well, I, nothing particular, Sarah. I think the points you made there were absolutely right. I think a lot of the time when we're collaborating, we try and choose partners who will add to what we have done or already and effectively use placement opportunities and learning opportunities to grow things that we have online or to provide illustrations of things. So I think uh, we, we feel in NLS that uh, the resources for what we would like to do are always far less than, than uh, what, what I, I think that they, they could be. And, and so the collaborations, if they work well, can allow everything to grow and the people who are students, the academics um, and the library can all benefit. Uh, it isn't always easy choosing those and knowing which ones will work, but uh, I think yeah, uh, that's really all I would like to say there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I sort of wondered, um, Alan, maybe if you could say something from the German perspective when it comes to sort of research collaboration, those new projects, what's your resourcing situation like, or how do you approach these things in, in the organizational structure? And if it's easier, by all means, please uh, say it in German and then we can translate. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, if you are, uh, if it's okay, I would just say it in German um, and would, uh, please, uh, oder bitte, ich bitte Ewald um zu übersetzen, Entschuldigung, ich bin, ähm, ja, also es ist ähm, in Deutschland so oder in, in, äh, doch in Deutschland vor allen Dingen so, dass äh, die Fachreferenten in den Häusern, ähm, in den Bibliotheken da den entsprechenden Kontakt zu den ähm, Wissenschaftlern herstellen ähm, und entsprechend auch ähm, in eine Ausbildung genossen haben, die in vielen Fällen ähm, sie in die Lage versetzt, entsprechend äh, zu agieren. Heißt also, sie haben ein Studium absolviert in einem der Fächer und dies ähm, dann ähm, mit einem weiteren Studium im Bereich der Bibliothekswissenschaften verbunden. Ähm, wir haben hier als Volluniversität äh, von der Medizin über die Geisteswissenschaften bis äh, ja, Naturwissenschaften, Herr Kosatl hat es schon gesagt, eigentlich alle äh, Fächer vertreten. Ähm, natürlich haben wir nicht in allen Fächern äh, Fachreferenten. Das würde unser, äh, unsere Personalkapazität doch deutlich überstreiten. Aber natürlich gibt es äh, ähnliche ja, wie soll man sagen, ähnliche ähm, äh, ja, Fächerkulturen an der Stelle. Also die Naturwissenschaften und Medizin kann man da schon sehr deutlich zusammenfassen. Auch in den Geisteswissenschaften wird natürlich ähnlich gearbeitet und entsprechend sind auch unsere Fachreferenten ähm, dann in der Lage, sich auf die verschiedenen Fächer einzustellen. 
Und ähm, insofern haben wir ähm, da jetzt im Aufbau auch Projekte, dass wir ähm, regelmäßig beraten ähm, mit dem Open Science Team, das wir zusätzlich gegründet haben. Also heißt nochmal Kollegen, die sich sehr auf diesen Bereich spezialisieren ähm, und dann gemeinsam mit den Fachreferenten in Beratungen von ähm, Wissenschaftlern äh, oder aber auch Studierenden gehen, wenn es da um ähm, ja, Open Data und ähnliche Dinge geht. Vielleicht erstmal so viel. Um, I'll try a quick translation. Um, um, yes, talking about, about uh, expertise, personnel, um, um, how, how does that work in at German libraries? Um, Ellen pointed out that uh, our subject specialists who are very often in close contact with the uh, professors, with the uh, scholars and scientists, um, have a professional training Uh, because they did a PhD, very often a PhD before they uh, did uh, extra um, professional library training. Um, a PhD or they have a master degree like in geoscience, etc. And uh, then they, uh, they had extra professional library training and now in the library uh, in at Halle, but also the at other libraries in Germany. Uh, we have a lot of colleagues um, who's, who originally specialized in one or two subject areas, then did extra library training, uh, and now are working together and collaborating with, with scholars and researchers and scientists. And in addition, um, at Halle, they, um, they uh, They started with a new open science team um, to um, give even more support to uh, scientists and scholars. So um, I might add that um, in, in many cases, it looks uh, like, like a mixture of uh, professional librarians plus, uh, plus other people working in libraries who have library training or who, who don't even have library training, um, who are collaborating within the library and then they are collaborating with, uh, with scholars and scientists. Um, as a quick follow-on question um, from me, and I think this probably goes to any organization that say has a digital scholarship, digital research or open, open science team, um, what is what have you found as sort of effective ways for skill sharing? I mean, I would assume that, say, um, not every map curator or not every Fachreferent in Germany would necessarily have some of the digital skills that are needed. So there probably needs to be some skill transfer or training program to to sort of help them have the skills that they need to be be credible partners for research. Um, how are you uh, approaching this at, at your different organizations? And I see uh, there's a hand raised, but Annette, is this on that point? Yeah. Let's get you unmuted. Please turn on the microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, perfect. Let's, um, give you a little insight of my day-to-day -day work, what works sort of in collaboration. Um, we are a small library, of course, in Hildesheim, and we cannot do possibly everything on our own. So um, what is really useful is a community, the RDMO community for um, data management planning, for the writing of the data management plan. This was earlier a topic, so that really helps. So the um, community helped the library to write or to work on question catalogs. That is one um, aspect. And also um, what really works internationally with British colleagues as well is the whole question about discipline specific metadata that is um, yeah, really useful. I could um, take some sort of standards that have already been developed um, and I can give advice uh, like that. More practically, um, what is really uh, useful is um, to invite 
other um, groups um, from the research communities. We have the national research, um, the NFDI, um, which is um, the national research infrastructure for Germany, the consortia are being um, yeah, established now. They've started last year towards building the European Open Science Cloud. And altogether, that works really well. The library is often in the middle. It's kind of the bridge um, to the broad project and that um, NFDI consortia. So yeah, briefly and collaboration in all the talks today here, it was um, point and especially for building these research commons, the cooperation is yeah, most helpful, I think. Thank you for sharing this, Anate. That was really Thank interesting. Thank you for asking. Um, Sarah, Chris, any comments from your experience on this? Uh, I could just make a, a quick comment uh, to, to your, your question, uh, Torsten. I think actually getting the right students with the right skills has been a real issue over the, the years. And quite often um, some students will take better to aspects of the project than, than others, things like JavaScript coding or creating an observable notebook, for example, are not something that everyone finds that easy. One of the benefits I found of being in a national library is that we're trying to pitch a lot of our services towards a broader public than simply academia. So we cre we're creating uh, at the moment guides for reusing our maps inside uh, GIS and tools for transcribing and writing features and trying to write those for, if you like, a a general audience rather than an academic audience. And that can actually be quite helpful for academic partners as well. And a lot of our, our if you like, map services are quite specific. Uh, they're things that people who are very into maps will know about, but recognizing that most of the world uh, is not in that category and pitching things towards that more general audience can actually help the academic projects as well. So that people who may feel quite uh, daunted, if you like, by some of the, uh, the detail or the technology could actually read quite an easy how-to guide and quickly get started with things. And we're, we're hoping to do more of that kind of uh, work in the future. I, I won't say we crack that issue at all, but it's kind of one response to those problems you raised. I'll just follow on from Chris there. In terms of um, also skilling up within the library, um, we offer um, library carpentry courses for um, our colleagues now in collaboration with the Software Sustainability Institute. Um, and they go from um, right through from data management and spreadsheets through to Python and R. And we're really encouraging as many people in the library as possible to do this, whether they're um, what we term library professionals like curators through to estates professionals or, or other areas too. Um, and, um, you know, even if people aren't going to be directly coding with the collections so that they understand the possibilities um, and what's possible um, with the collections in terms of um, digital research methods, for example. Um, so I think that's um, that's really useful in terms of a culture change as well as a skills change within the library. And I've, I think also, as Chris um, mentioned in his talk, that often um, we'll go to researchers um, for collaborations on projects where they can offer complementary skills too. And often that is the technical side of things still at the moment, particularly around AI. Um, it's, it's the researchers who are doing the, um, the clever crunching there um, and we're providing the ideas, I guess. Um, but there's work within the library as well to upskill in various areas too. Thank you, that was really interesting. There, there was a question earlier in the chat that's sort of a little bit of a follow on question uh, and Sarah that was directed at you. So I'm just asking it uh, now. And the, the question was, can you tell us a bit more about how you collaborate with Edinburgh University to offer courses and classes, e.g. on data visualization or design? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I should um, emphasize that these are specifically Edinburgh University courses, not Edinburgh University and NLS courses. So they're, we're, we're offering informal support to them. Um, I guess this kind of collaboration is one of my um, one of my favorite areas of things. We, we, it's a bit of wheeling and dealing in a way. Um, this is kind of getting out on the ground, keeping your ear to the ground, knowing who's doing what and whether it's locally or nationally or even internationally sometimes and joining the dots. So it's a case of thinking, well, we're about to release this data set. I know this academic's interested in this or they're teaching this course around this topic. Perhaps this will be relevant and I approach them with, an, with a suggestion or sometimes they approach us too. Um, it's, it's a complete mix. Um, we've got there's one class at Edinburgh University that has an annual data fair where you go along and you pitch ideas and, and challenges and data sets and we've been quite successful on that year on year so that's a planned one um, but otherwise it's all quite opportunistic I'd say and it depends on who you know what's happening and um, yeah it's, it's a part of the job that I really enjoy to be honest this wheeling and dealing side of it. I don't know if I can just uh, uh, leap in and add to that too we also have made great use of master's courses, which often will have a requirement for a three to six month dissertation. And rather like Sarah's kind of uh, fairs, the, there's been something like a beauty contest to these, where usually around this time of year, December, January, they invite external uh, institutions to come along to uh, an event to talk through ideas for collaborative uh, projects. And we pitched to the MSc in GIS Edinburgh University with some students for some years. And then more recently uh, through the maths department who are more involved in the machine learning for different ideas. And that's been very successful where uh, out of 60 or, or 80 students, you may get one or two who then come and speak about it further. And these can then become a project where they can uh, quite often make very significant progress on developing a particular problem as part of their thesis for the master's course. Yeah, thank you, Chris, also for adding this. Just to say from personal experience, I had a few opportunities to work with uh, master's students uh, in different roles, and that's always been really interesting because they often bring an interesting, fresh perspective to it. And they're also a good link into communities that maybe um, <clears throat> We don't necessarily always engage with actively as we should, because I sometimes find that obviously what one tends to be drawn to these successful professors who have the good chance of bringing the great grant in. And then once you work with them, you tend to work with them again and they have more projects and therefore more successful. So I think anything that helps to reach out to more early career researchers and to those that aren't the usual suspects from in particular the, the sort of well-funded universities or departments, I think must be a good thing in general. May I add to that quickly, Torsten? Sorry, uh, I'll be really quick. Um, I, I agree on the master's student front as well, because um, particularly setting up a new service at speed that we have been with the Digital Scholarship Service and, and proving its worth quickly. Um, master's student projects have been really valuable, just working with them. We know their quick turnaround um, finite projects where then we've got a quick output. We can show um, both international communities, but also um, within the library um, that um, the, the value of, of this kind of work. And so it's been really useful in demonstrating value in a, in a quick way as well, which is a very practical way of seeing it, but it's useful too. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just wanted to say there's been a few interesting things been posted in the chat, also links to um, resources or activities. So I'll encourage you to take a look into the chat. And you'll also see there's been a question on the tiny houses to Ellen, but I think Ellen has already answered that one in the chat. So in the interest of time, I think I'll just quickly refer to this, but I wanted to pick up one question that was asked fairly early on, shortly after Matt's presentation. Uh, so Matt, that one's uh, for you. Um, and the question was, if I got this right, you said the majority of answers was from arts and humanities, but also findings from STEM subjects. Was there also anything from the field of social sciences, business and economics? Thanks, Torsten. I, I responded um, in chat, so there is quite a lengthy response there, but just to reiterate, the, the focus of the study was arts, humanities and social sciences. Um, this is sometimes referred to in the UK as shape, which is a term that is uh, sort of the, the equivalent to STEM, which has taken root. So yes, social sciences were represented within the report and is referenced in some of the case studies, which there's a link to in chat. 
Business and economics, uh, not so much. Um, and th th these weren't referred to specifically, but that's not to say that there aren't great examples um, out there. Great. Thank you, Matt. And sorry for, uh, for missing the answer in the chat. Um, looking through your chat, uh, I see there's another question. Um, I think that's for everyone on the panel, or indeed colleagues from the audience who might have a, a view on this. How do you guide researchers towards using your data besides the teaching? In our situation, researchers often don't realize what data we have and the expertise the library has to offer, even though we actively reach out to them. Um, maybe, Alan, Alan, if you could say something from, from your perspective on how you sort of promote and share what the library offers and, and get researchers engaged, and then maybe colleagues from the NLS can also add their comments. Ich starte wieder in, in, in Deutsch. Es tut mir leid, heute ist aber nicht viel zu wollen. Ähm, wir haben ähm, durch dieses Open Science Team entsprechende ähm, Veranstaltungen, die sich ähm, einmal im Semester mit einem Open Science Day ähm, eigentlich starten. Das heißt, ähm, man informiert die wissenschaftliche Öffentlichkeit darüber, dass dieser Tag stattfindet. Der war jetzt natürlich aufgrund der Pandemie Online. Wir haben die ganzen Services, die wir bieten, aufgezählt. Wir gehen dann mit den Fachreferenten in die entsprechenden Institutsräte und machen darauf noch einmal aufmerksam, was es an, an Services gibt. Natürlich müssen wir auch schon bei den Studierenden ansetzen. Da fangen wir aber natürlich an mit den ganz normalen Erstsemester-Schulungen und würden dann wenn wir uns bekannt gemacht haben, ja auch mit Datenbankschulungen weitermachen, wo man im Prinzip den Fachreferenten als Ansprechpartner kennenlernt, um dann eben diesen Kontakt schon in die, für die späteren Wissenschaftler aufzubauen. Wie weit würden Sie übersetzen? Ja, okay. Uh, uh, short translation. Um, yeah, reaching out to, uh, to the academic community on campus. Um, various formats um, they're using at Halle University, uh, like uh, the Open Science Day organized by the Open Science Team. And that's an, um, an opportunity to get into contact with scholars and with scientists. Um, on that day, the, uh, the library um, uh, gives an overview of its services and also special services for uh, certain subjects and, and for researchers. Um, also, um, they are, uh, they are uh, going to departmental meetings. Um, they are attending meetings uh, within departments, explaining uh, their library services and use uh, that could be of interest for research projects, for instance. And on a lower level, of course, uh, reaching out to students uh, by, uh, by introductory courses to the uh, library services, etc. So, uh, um, different formats for reaching out, for getting into contacts um, with scholars, researchers, students, students on various levels. And re reaching out, one point I, I'd like to add is um, that our experience has been really um, encouraging um, each time we are getting into contact with especially new research, uh, scholars and uh, new personnel on campus, uh, the first contact gives us a very good opportunity to introduce our services and um, many, uh, many new scholar scientists, uh, of course, are pursuing research projects. And uh, very often they are actually writing on, on proposals and that when people like Annette come in and, and uh, support uh, them when it comes to uh, writing data management plans, for instance. So contacts are important. And uh, also finding ways of, 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 uh, of structuring the way you are approaching um, new personnel, new scholars, new scientists on campus. Uh, great. Um, thank you, Alan, and thank you, Eva, for the uh, 
almost live translation. Um, any quick comments, Chris or Sarah? Hi. Okay, very quickly from me then, um, lots of things, I guess, um, uh, from the top of my head, we work closely with our social media colleagues to get everything we do out on our social media platforms. Um, we uh, embed ourselves in the digital scholarship community, which is a very digital, it's, it's very online, but um, making sure that all the work we do, releases of data sets are out on different email lists, and making sure that we're connecting the dots between, you know, we've released this data set. I know this academic is probably going to be interested in this. Let's let's um, approach them about it. Um, shouting about everything we do, basically, and making sure that everyone knows what's happening um, and approaching relevant communities uh, relevant individuals, relevant audiences. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's been the main approach so far, I guess. And um, Chris, do you have anything to add from the maps service side? Uh, well, well, not just to the, the maps, but I think you, you haven't said, Sarah, the most important way is really the data foundry itself, which as you say, is a new development for the library. And the data foundry has very good spider ability by search engines and provides a shop window for each of the data sets. And that's very important. There are other data portals that exist all over the place that are not very uh, findable, nor do they really promote what the data is. And I think the value of the data foundry is that there are quick pages that take a few minutes to read and each one describes this is the data set this is how we created it this is the kind of thing that you can do with it and uh, i think that's very it's very important from the maps point of view the data foundry deliberately replicates pages that we have that allow the data to be downloaded as well recognizing people come to our website from different directions and through different kinds of keyword but i think as sarah said you can't really uh hold back on any different kind of web presentation or format. I think the more, the merrier. And I know there are lots of people in the world at large who probably could benefit from data we make available who haven't found it yet. And it's always quite a challenge. I think, okay, we've got to, we've got to go further and reach these people, but we're certainly doing better than we were uh, a few years ago. Thank you. Thank you. I think I would have a few more questions, but in the interest of time, I suspect we probably need to wrap up now. So, Ivald, if I can hand over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, um, it looks like we touched on an important uh, issue, um, a general issue. Uh, libraries, librarians as partners um, of scholars and scientists. Um, librarians, people working in libraries. And we saw uh, a number of examples for collaboration. Uh, collaboration already uh, going on, but also perhaps suggestions for new further collaborations um, in research projects uh, with regard to teaching, but also with regard to reaching out to like creative artists and other people.